Here it is, nine o'clock. Welcome to the Superior Stream. It's Mayo here. Gonna have all kinds of fun stuff going on tonight. Uh, we have Fallout 4 bottle cap mailing. Have some information on Fallout 4 uh, E3 trailer, along with internet in space and uh, internet on the ground, and some, I guess, thoughts on the PS4's backwards compatibility or lack thereof. But let me let me go ahead and I guess get started here. I said the first uh, first uh, thing on the docket. Let me pull up pull up my news here. going. Alright, so apparently this guy has sent Bethesda 2,000 bottle caps. That's that's right, 2,000 actual bottle caps. And if, if you're familiar with the Fallout series, bottle caps are used as a currency in the post-apocalyptic wasteland of this game. And let me go ahead and get the window pulled up here. Alright, uh, well, yeah, here, yeah, uh, this is on VG247. Uh, one super Fallout fan who goes by Gator Machete Jr. on Imager has attempted to do something not many could think of, sending Fallout 4 developers at Bethesda over 2,000 bottle caps to reserve a copy of the game. Let's see, and it says here, in his, in his own words, Fallout 3 was my favorite game for several years. I can imagine, buddy. So I made the rational choice <laughs> to start saving up bottle caps, he says in the album description. Turns out 4.5 years <laughs> of undergrad and three years in master's program leads to a lot of drinking. Well, who, well, who would have thought? <laughs> Let's see. In the note he sent with his collection, Gator Machete Jr. said that he has been saving up bottle caps for almost eight years. So... That is that is a lot of bottle caps. Let's see. So and, and and here's his message personally to Bethesda. Hello boys and girls. If it's not already obvious, I'm a pretty big fan of the series. Needless to say, I got pretty excited when I started seeing more and more of about Fallout 4. I've also noticed you're now accepting pre-orders. I only saw prices listed in pre-war dollars, which is a jab at I guess uh, the games if you've seen them. There's pre-war money, which they refer to as like the old cash, whereas, of course, the, the regular currency in the game being bottle caps. And I wasn't exactly sure what the exchange rate is these days. Yuck, yuck. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. This, get a load of this joker. So I went ahead and sent everything I've been able to save since I played Fallout 3 for the first time. <laughs> Using my bathroom scale, which he's probably never used for anything else, mind you. Uh... Uh, I found on Wikipedia, I'm thinking this is somewhere in the range of 2,240 caps. That ought to cover it, right? I'm a PC person, and my Steam ID is, of course, and I'm not going to show that. And if that doesn't work out, my email is, of course, that's also sensitive as well. If my caps are not acceptable form of payment, let me know, and I'm sure we can work something out. <laughs> Additionally... I'm going to be moving in August, so if you need to send me anything, like a return of my life savings, <laughs> wow, that's sad, uh, after then, uh, then return address won't be any good, just email me and we can sort it out. Thanks for taking the time to read this, and here's hoping 7.5 years worth of bottle cap hoarding doesn't end up in the Bethesda trash can. <laughs> Seth something or another. So. This guy sent in, he sent in a load of caps. Like, a seriously large amount of bottle caps. Do, do I think they should give him a pre-order copy of Fallout 4? I don't think so. That's, that might be maybe a little too generous. Although, I, I, will, I don't think uh, perhaps a, a personally signed letter from Bethesda, I know, congratulating, congratulating him on his uh, masterful saving is out of the question. Or maybe some kind of certificate or little trophy showing that he really is uh, a a uh, person who walks in the wasteland. So I, I got a kick out of that story. 
Wait, let me see what else we have here. Close this out real quick. Uh, next, I want to I want to talk about some some Fallout 4 features. Uh, and then you, you can watch all these on the uh, Bethesda E3 trailer, which I'll I'll post links to after this wraps up. Uh, there's a, a number of different things people are concerned about. I'm I'm gonna cover three things that I I really got uh, excited or not excited about. Uh, the first thing being on a lot of people's minds is the, I guess what most would call simplified conversation quote-unquote wheel. Although they can't actually use a conversation wheel because I think Bioware has a, uh, they have like some kind, what's the word for it? It's, um, they have a, uh, yeah, Bioware has a copyright on the actual wheel version of a conversation wheel. So instead of a wheel per se, they're using just the buttons. And this limits conversations to, from what I've seen, basically four button presses. Whereas in the past, you could have a whole list of conversation options based on how you wanted to proceed through a social interaction in the game. And uh, for Fallout, uh, depending on how you, you know, lay your stats on the ground, uh, social interaction can be a big part of the game. In fact, I think in every every Fallout game that has been released, there's been an option to defeat the final boss by talking him out of his uh, dastardly scheme. Of course, you have to have all of your points in charisma, just about, but uh, at the very least, the option is still there. So with this more simplified conversation wheel, uh, a lot of people are concerned, and rightly so, that this is going to dumb down the, 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 the charisma, I guess, aspect of the Fallout series, which is, you know, if, if you give your character zero intelligence, he'll sound like a caveman. If you give him a lot of intelligence, he'll he'll speak eloquently and, uh, you know, use fancy pants kind of words and language. So is this smaller, is this smaller conversation wheel going to limit those kind of options? Uh, are you going to get the same kind of social interaction that you normally would out of a Fallout game? Of course, some people don't care that much about uh, conversation wheels and dialogue options. Some people just like blowing super mutants into tiny bloody bits or gibs, if you will. Uh, but like I said, if, if you're a long-time fan of the Fallout series, and I've, I've only started playing it since Fallout 3, so I really have no room to speak in terms of, of a longer-term fan, but if, if you played since Fallout 3, you're, you're probably... Let's see, that came out in 2000... 2006 or so, 2007. So at least at least for seven years, you know. And if you've probably played the new ones, there's a good chance you've at least went back and checked out the old ones. I haven't myself, so shame on me. But uh, like I said, it's a long-standing tradition in the Fallout series. Um, do I think that the lack of dialogue options is going to necessarily ruin the game? Uh, I, w I would say no. But like I said, I'm also I'm trying to look at it as just a game and not a Fallout game. You know? And with that, uh, what 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 do I want to say? Like I said, when when you come out with a Fallout game, there's a certain expected level of quality of uh, of uh, of a nuance you have both with with the story and how your character can interact with the story. So having a more streamlined dialogue option, option tree, however you want to phrase it, it's, it, I'm not sure if it'll feel really like a Fallout game. Especially, if, like I said, if you're used to big branching dialogue trees where you try to talk someone out of blowing you up or some other significant plot point. Uh, another thing I witnessed during the stream for the Fallout 4 was the town building aspect and a lot of people are excited about that, and understandably so, <laughs> uh, because it uh, it looks it looks cool. You basically can tear down parts of a town, reassemble them in your own way. You can you can have like a shanty-looking town or a more robust, I guess like bunker kind of habitat, however you want to phrase it. You can have electrical lines, turrets, bartering trails, and pre pretty much however you want to design it. Of course. Whether or not they actually deliver on these promises, we don't yet know. Whether it's going to be kind of, 
eh, meh. And like I said, that, that'll be of the wait for the game to actually be released. I am cautiously optimistic, but I'm not getting too terribly hyped up. Because as as they actually said in the trailer, there's going to pre be there there is going to be uh, pre-designated building zones. So what I can imagine is there'll be, depending on how big the map is, probably 10 to 15 places maybe where you can kind of start up towns or maybe not start up towns, but make little trading posts and places where you can kind of stop by and drop off all your junk before continuing on on, on your wasteland excursion. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, with, with the more casualized aspect of what, it was look, what, what it's looking like to be more casualized, I'm not sure how in-depth they can actually make the town building. Like I said, it, it looked nice in the trailer, but like I said, it's a real kind of thing where I want to get my hands on it before I really bless it or curse it. But uh, just if I were to be totally optimistic, like I said, the idea of building up your own little shanty town does seem appealing. And that, that, and you get to defend it from raiders, and I'm assuming mutants and super mutants, and all manner of, of guys who want to blow you, blow you into bits and gibbs. Uh, I guess, I guess that's about all I have for that. Uh, I could talk about the armor customization, but it's pretty much the same way I feel about uh, the town building. Like I said, it, it looks cool, in theory, it would be really cool if it does work right, but I, I would really want to get my hands on it before I say one way or the other. Um, the last bit I want to talk about, which won't, won't be too big, let's see here, is the uh, the dog, dog meat. I've heard a few bits of information about him, and from what I've seen in the trailer, he looks pretty cool. Uh, he can fetch, you can pet him. Uh, I'm assuming he can also help out in combat. And one thing I read recently that y your dog cannot actually die. Which is a bit strange, since usually in all the Fallout games your companions can actually uh, become dead. They, they can get killed. Um, so I... I I don't like the idea of dog meat being unkillable, but at the same time, uh, if you've ever had a dog in any of the previous Fallout games, it is a bit of a chore trying to keep him alive. At least he was for Fallout 3 and Fallout 3 New Vegas, because, like I said, if, if you don't pay attention, your dog will be killed in those games. And once, I don't know, I think, uh, let's see, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure once your AI friends die, in Fallout 3 and in New Vegas, they're they're dead forever. So I think maybe maybe they wanted to go a bit easier on on this next game, the next installment in the Fallout series. But at the same time, I've heard that your follower NPCs for Fallout 4 will be able to die. So I'm not sure why they're gonna go easy on the dog, but not regular humans. Totally, totally humanist. The dog bias. Oh, uh, but, uh, yeah, o overall, if I had to say one way or the other, am I going to get Fallout 4? I probably wouldn't buy it on release, because you can almost count on it having every manner of bug and glitch in the book. So, I, I wouldn't, I would not buy it on launch day. I would definitely wait for it to go on sale on Steam. Uh, or... If you're a more hardy fella, you could maybe pirate it, yar. If if you're into that sort of thing, I don't, know. I, don't I don't I don't think I'll pirate it. Partly because there's supposed to be multiplayer aspects, which may I think be a bit limited if you pirate it, and also because I can only imagine how big it is gigabyte wise, and I, I don't want to clog up clog up my already diminishing space that I have on my multiple drives, so. I said more than likely I I probably will end up buying it, but not on not on launch day. Who Nelly? What do we got next on the docket? Is is Skyrim? Well, not Skyrim, I should say, but the Elder Scrolls Online a bigger flop than the Tortanic? And when I 
say Tortanic, I'm referring to, of course, uh, Star Wars The Old Republic. If you're not familiar with either of these games, that's probably for the best, because from what I've heard, both of them blow. But, uh, for the uninitiated, let me, let me go ahead and explain a little bit. Uh, first off, Star Wars The Old Republic is an is a MMO uh, based on the, of course, best-selling Star Wars franchise. Um, this isn't the first Star Wars MMO, mind you. The first one uh, was Star Wars Galaxies, which was canceled back in... I don't even know, because I'm not a fan of that game, but it was a, quite a while ago. So, this is the second MMO based on Star Wars really to come out. And it, uh, it had a high watermark to hit, because the original Star Wars Galaxies was a great game. But, um, Star Wars Galaxies, despite having a pretty good initial burst of subscribers, gradually lost its player count over time, and eventually ended up going free-to-play. Okay, so that's, that's a little brief history on the Tortanic, as a lot of people refer to it. The newer... MMO that is kind of floundering at the moment and is going to go free to play if it has not already gone free to play is uh, The Elder Scrolls Online. And if you're not familiar with that, again, like I said, that's probably for the best. Um, to brief you on The Elder Scrolls, it's a, The Elder Scrolls is a great series of RPGs um, if you're into that sort of RPG where you run around, hit stuff with a sword, uh, you talk to people. It's uh, in the same vein as Fallout. In fact, I believe Bethesda developed uh, both Oblivion as well as uh, Skyrim, the most recent uh, chapter in the Elder Scrolls franchise. Uh, the Elder Scrolls Online, though, deviates a bit from the single-player formula. Uh, of course, it has to since it's an MMO. Duh. Um, but... Uh, when it deviated from the single-player formula, it seems to have also deviated from the quality that the single-player's formula had. Because, uh, as I understand, there weren't that many initial subscribers. And though it has picked up a few subscribers along the way, it's not the most uh, best-selling MO on the market at the, at the moment. It's not doing that well. And like, as I previously mentioned, it is planned to go free-to-play. Uh, now both, like I said, SOTOR, or the Tortanic, and the Elder Scrolls both go in free-to-play. Just because they're free-to-play doesn't necessarily mean they're bad games. Although, usually, uh, correlation-wise, uh, the correlation does not equal causation, but in the case of uh, the Elder Scrolls Online and uh, the Tortanic, which I'll refer to the Elder Scrolls Online as T-E-S-O, or TESO from now on for simplicity's sake, I think... Both these games going free to play was a strong indicator that they're just not good. But uh, the question I posed was which is a bigger flop? I, I researched both, and both of the games had a budget of around two hundred million dollars, which is, is quite a bit of money. <laughs> that's that's a lot of money. That's uh, that's enough money to make a, a whole bunch of like B movies. Uh, and a, few, and a few good A A movies, I guess. But uh, I guess if you you can't really measure it in monetary wise, which is a bigger flop. I would have to say, based on what I've seen so far, the bigger flop would have to be The Elder Scrolls Online, uh, because like I said, the, the initial push for uh, for uh, Star Wars. Uh, Star Wars my mind's going blank here. For the Tortanic, the initial subscriber base was actually pretty good. So when they eventually did have to start uh, shifting the game over to, over to a free-to-play market, they had a lot of people who had played uh, SOTOR before and went back to it, you know, because, you know, they, they paid $50, $60 for the game new, plus had to pay for the subscription fee, so I figure a lot of people may have felt cheated uh, well, I guess they, they felt cheated either way, but, uh, I need a drink of water. One second. Take a, take a brief moment, if, if you're out there, just 
grab a snack, a Rooney. I'll be I'll be right back. I'm gonna grab a bit of water. There we go. All right. That's a bit better. But a bit of a rustling of a microphone sound. That lets you know I'm moving around. Okay. But uh, where was I? I was rambling about uh, which is a bigger flop, uh, the Tortanic or Tesso. And like I said, I'm, I am in of the firm belief it is Tesso. Bia Cuez. Like I said, it did not have as big of an initial install base. And the reason for that is the initial beta or alpha of the game, it looked really bad. So a lot of people saw the alpha and they thought, well, this is just going to be a cheap cash grab MMO that'll go free to play in a few months, which it did. And now <laughs> it looks it looks like all those uh, people who held out the reservations uh, were wise to do so because it did go free to play. And from what I've heard, it has not improved significantly since the alpha. And, and the beta and so forth. I mean, it as a game, it is serviceable, but in regards to it actually being fun, that would be up for debate. Now, I do have to, full, to full disclosure here, I've not played either Tesso or the Tortanic. Um, I was kind of interested in playing the Tortanic when it went free to play, but I saw how big the download was, and I also saw all the restrictions that came with the Tortanic uh, if you're if you're playing on the free to play account, you basically can't do anything except run around a little bit. Um, hopefully, if uh, Tesso is any kind of smart, they won't go the same route as the Tortanic did, and limiting the player base in what they can do in game wise, because that's that's definitely not going to win them any more subscribers than they already don't have. And in, in the long run. I would have to say which game will be shut down first would probably be Tesso. Because like I said, I think the Tortanic is going, it's not going strong. It's not even going good. It's, it's, it's puttering by. And I think it will out putter Tesso at, at, at its going rate. But, uh, let's see. Take a look, see. Here we go. Here's, here's, uh, something. The, the next, the next bit of my docket here. I'll get I'll get an internet page pulled up so you can read along with me. All right. There we go. Uh, Sony has no plans for backwards compatibility for the PlayStation 4, which is not a big surprise. Uh, if if you've been paying attention to any consoles in the in the past console generation or two, backwards compatibility has not really been that big of, uh, of an issue for them. The only thing really that I can think of that was backwards compatible, let's see here, the, the Wii could play GameCube games. The, let's see, the 360 could play some Xbox games, but there was kind of a niche to it, like it had to, it had to have patches for each individual game, so that was kind of a misnomer that I think a lot of people got a bit perturbed about. Um, uh, what else was there? The PS3 was supposed to have PS2 backwards compatibility, but they originally kind of phased that out. And as I understand, I don't believe the Xbox One has Xbox 360 backwards compatibility. I'm not sure about that. I'll need to check my sources. Uh, that's, that's some research I should have done before this stream, but I I did not have as much time as I would have liked to gather information and such. Uh, let's see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's take a look. See here. Uh, let me see if I can't read from the article here. Ba -ba -ba -ba, where we got? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll read the whole bit here. 
the title is indeed correct. At this time, Sony has no plans to allow for backwards compatibility on the PlayStation 4, preferring instead to focus on new features and services for PlayStation users revealed in a Polygon interview with Shihui Yoshida of the Sony Computer Entertainment's Head of Worldwide Studios. This news comes on the heels of the Xbox conference at E3 2015, where the company announced the that the Xbox One would gradually roll out backwards compatibility for 360 titles. Okay, so so the Xbox One should have some backwards pad compatibility for the 360 at some point, you know. But eh, that'll I'm pretty sure that's going to be on their back burner. Also, it looks like my stream has completely died out. Not sure. Probably. I'll blame I'll blame YouTube, and I'll blame my terrible terrible internets. That and I'm also talking quite a bit. But uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, yeah, like I said, for for the Xbox One, I'm fairly confident that any kind of backwards compatibility they have is going to be on the back burner. It's not going to be something they're worried about that that much. Let's see. Following up with that list, uh, or following up with a list of currently available titles to play on the Xbox One, uh, the games are able to be played due to the Xbox One running what is essentially an emulator for the 360, and the plans are to have 100 titles able to be played by holiday 2015. Let's see here. And my internet is it is is tanking. So if you're watching and it cut out, that is the reason why. So um, if if you want to know what's happening, I will upload. Of course, like I said this the the proper copy, which I'm recording locally, once I finish up this stream here. Uh, but let me let me continue on here. <sighs> the backwards compatibility. News was interesting. The technology involved must be very challenging, said Yoshida, following up with a, I don't think we'll, we will change our approach. The PlayStation 4 doesn't have backward compatibility. According to Yoshida, the company prefers to focus on new features and services such as the upcoming media player for the PlayStation 4 and continue developing services such as PlayStation Now, Let's see, PlayStation Now would be the next best thing for the PS4 owners looking for backwards compatibility, as it offers the ability to stream older games directly to your PS4. Which, this is what I saw coming down the pipe for a while. Uh, it's it's a lot more cost-effective to stream, uh, at least if, if you're the company, I think. Instead of trying to, I guess, put each individual game up on a digital store, uh, well, although I guess I didn't think about that. Well, if if you're hosting them and someone downloads, well, yeah. But if you're doing that, then you have to have an emulator like the 360, well, like the 360 emulator. Uh, uh, I get, yeah. I get streaming would be the the next best option to having them on an online store. But like I said, if if they have PS1 or PS2 games or PS3 games on the online store, they have to have some kind of emulator running it on the PS4. Uh, otherwise, they, of course, they'd have to be streaming it. And that emulator is, is the real hitch. The funny thing is, I'm sure within the next console generation or two, we'll have PCs running you know, Xbox One and PS4 emulators. I can already see that coming. Uh, but let me get back to the article here. When Polygon asked uh, about why exactly the company wasn't pursuing backwards compatibility, Yoshida responded, Backward compatibility is hard. I won't say we'll never do it, but it's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> As I just said, pretty much. If it was easy, we would have done that. <laughs> oh. uh, this may be frustrating to many, but there is a good explanation for why Sony is likely not exploring backwards compatibility. And it's two words. Cell processor. The architecture behind the PlayStation 3's cell processor and the PlayStation 4's x86-64 architecture are so very different that it would be monument. It would be a monumental task to be able to get backwards compatibility working smoothly. I.e., it's too hard. We don't want to do it. 
so we'll just stream it. So, uh, so for the many people looking to see if Sony had a response to the Xbox's conference backwards compatibil compatibility announcement, it would have seemed uh, we have the final answer, but it's not completely ruled out. So thanks, Mr. Uh, Rudolidge Douglot of Tech Raptor, for your wonderful article. All right, but like I said, I I kind of saw this coming. Uh, there's, it's it's tricky enough getting a disk drive that'll you know play with all the different disk formats of past generations. Uh, even more so, I imagine, you know, like I said, for getting the emulator going. Uh, as a person who is a big advocate of preserving our past, our history, our, our culture of gaming, um, I'm, I'm, I support any kind of option that allows us to preserve those games that you, we can no longer really play unless you have an emulator or the original console. So good on the PS4, at least, for having some options, hopefully down the pike. Uh, Really, I guess the, the their best option I would want would to see would to be an online store similar to Steam. And of course, they have PlayStation Now and so forth, but like that is limited to whatever games they have on there. And then they really need to expand that library. The same thing for the Xbox Xbox Marketplace. They need to have as many games that they can publish on that library as possible, because it's it it is a sad thing when you lose. Yeah, you know, when you lose those games, much like much like old movies that uh, deteriorate. But I've I've touched on that before in another show. I'll probably touch on that again at some other point. But I don't feel like digressing at the moment. So let let me get moving here onto the next onto the next thing. Let me get a, let me get a drink of water before my voice turns into complete gravel. <clears throat> that's a bit better. That's that's a little bit better. Alrighty. What do I have here? Internets. Here we go. Uh, basically, a 1984-style draconian internet law recently got passed in Europe. Basically, what it does... Um, I'm going to pull up a link here shortly. It'll give us a few more details. Basically, what it does is, uh, let's see if I can get the page pulled up here. What it'll do is hold a website host liable for the content people post on said website. So let me get this. this is, oh, this is also a Tech Raptor article. So let me go ahead and pull that back up. As as my internet flutters in and out of usability, oh lordy. Speaking of needing better internet, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm not sure if I'm gonna read the whole spiel of this article. But if you want to get into it, you can. Basically, what's going on is I said decidedly, web hosts, like I said, are responsible for any defamatory comments left. On websites, so let's say uh, let's say you have a website that's big on uh, roller skating, for for instance, and some guy who doesn't like a particular roller skater uh, was like, well, this this guy, you know, I heard I heard he does steroids. I heard that he uh, on the on the international underground roller skating circuit. He's, he's big for those roller skating drugs. Supposedly, then you, as, as the host of your roller skating fan site, <laughs> roller skating fan site, would be liable for that one guy talking such libelous trash about the aforementioned fake roller skating underground drug user. And uh, I, I guess, let's see here. I'm skimming through this article. I I'd skimmed it a bit, but I hadn't had time to really delve too deeply into it. Okay, here we go. 
Uh, here's here's some little snippet from it right here. Uh, the precedent set by this case has already affected smaller Estonian Estonia. Yeah, so I'm not sure what kind of libel they're worried about down in Estonia. Uh, do they even have cars and electricity down there? I, I'm just I'm giving giving me a nudge nudge a wink wink. I'm sure the Estonian people are a proud proud bunch of folks <laughs> over over in. Eastern Europe, someplace, wherever they are, wherever they reside, uh, which are with the Estonian forums, which do not have the manpower. <laughs> yuck, yuck, yuck! The manpower. There is li there's literally a man outside the forums. You know, he, he has to, is to, he has to, there's a guy on like a on, a, on, a, on an exercise bike charging up the uh, their, their servers uh, to moderate anonymous comments. This ruling contradicts the law already set on the web uh, content by e-commerce directive, let's see, the European equivalent of the DMCA, which broadly, broadly says the news sites such as Delphi are not, li are not liable for comments unless they refuse or, un or are unable to address uh, certain comments. However, the new precedent and loopholes in the directive require these sites to police their users or face possible legal actions. And like I said, they're, they're expecting it to, to like be able to be enforced almost immediately, from what I've read in, in the legalese of it. So if if you don't remove a comment under a certain span of time, what you'll run into is you'll you'll be charged some kind of legal fee, and maybe even have your site taken down because you weren't able to stop some guy from posting gore or defamatory comments at some obscene hour of the night. Which is, of course, nonsense. You know, you, you you can't control the internet. You know, you you can do your best to kind of curtail behaviors. You can you can you can delete posts after the fact, but you know, trying to like control an entire community and and be able to moderate it as soon as a post hits, or even within an hour or so of a post hitting, depending on when moderators are active, is is going to be a tricky endeavor. Never mind the issue that comes with just uh, having moderators having to review content, see if it breaks laws, you know, checking their books, and then going back to see, okay, yes, I can now review that, because it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis for each individual post that is or is not liable. So, yeah, good luck enforcing this piece of garbage legislation over in Europe. Although, let's see here. Uh, let's see, let me read the little snippet at the end here. For now, anonymous comments are still protected speech in most of Europe. However, small sites have already begun to close their comments and forums in Estonia to avoid litigation. Uh, Delphi has not chosen to appeal the decision so far. So if you want to read more into Delphi or what they're doing, go ahead and check out Mr. Kendra or Miss Kendra Pring on the Tech Raptor uh, regarding hosts deemed liable for user comments in Europe. And I'll I'll post I'll post links and such once I wrap up, uh, wrap up this uh, show. Close her down here. I'll close down that one. There we go. Okay. okay, we're moving right along, moving right along. Uh, in some more internet news, space internet, space nets, intergalactic whale fishing. Oh man, I don't even know. Uh, apparently, there's another, another Tech Raptor article as soon as I get it pulled up. Uh, What's his name? Uh, philanthropist, visionary, and uh, whatever his name is. Oh, Elon Musk, the co-founder of companies such as PayPal and the current CEO of SpaceX. Let me go ahead and get this pulled up for you. All right. He wants to, he wants to launch 40 some odd satellites in the space in an effort to beam down internets to poorly served areas of the planet, uh, you know, across America, Africa, so on and so forth, wherever wherever there's a uh, blackout of internet, uh, supposedly these these series of satellites in space, space, would allow uh, some modicum of internet availability. To which I say, eh, uh, it, I'm sure it will perform a satisfactory role as far as making this a, an economically viable internet 
you know, I don't think he's going to ever get any kind of return on this. Uh, I mean, even if the satellites are very cheap, the just to manage them, you know, shoot them in the space, so on and so forth. He would need a he would need a fairly good amount of subscribers to this service to make it workable. And those who do subscribe to this uh, space internet uh, would have a few issues. First of all, if you're using space internets or satellite internets, however you want to phrase it, um, you are going to run into issues of cloud cover, storms, magnetic interference from space so on and so forth, a multitude of issues that come with beaming internet down from space to planet Earth, uh, which you don't encounter if you have a hard line connection running across the, uh, the planet's surface. Uh, if you're familiar, familiar with HughesNet uh, and any number of other satellite services that you know, offer either television or internet services, you'll, you'll know that uh, while they do offer some advantages in terms of uh, coverage, they're going to lack uh, a bit of bandwidth speed that their uh, ground wire counterparts have. But I, I've, I've not read too much of this article. I kind of just skimmed it like the previous one. So let me let me take a look see here. I'll read the I'll read the last bit of the paragraph. Though seemingly novel, plans similar to Musk's have actually existed. Many are can are in can in incarnations over many years. Uh, Richard Branson of Virgin supposedly had similar project, uh, or has a similar project currently in the works. Bill Gates uh, is said to have toyed with similar idea in the 1990s. Another firm, Light Squared, abandoned this project a mere three years ago, and more recently Facebook has given up on a similar plan uh, that differed from Musk's by involving the construction of a single Five hundred million dollar satellite. Uh, this project proved to be more ambitious than the company could handle, and Facebook killed the project off before they even announced it. Let's see. Time will tell whether Musk's plan to build a multitude of satellites will prove effective. Although it certainly seems more logical. So I'm assuming it's more logical somewhere in the beef of this paragraph. But. Uh, even if the satellites of the 4,000 he's shooting in space, uh, did I say 40? So yeah, 40,000. 40, uh, even if they're relatively small, like the size of a trash can, still, to get that thing in space and orbiting uh, is going to be a trip. It's going to be a trick. Um, because it has to have power, so it'll have those little solar blade fans it has to have a, a dish to beam the internet down, and it has to have some kind of ball or, like I said, trash can, cylinder shape, something or another to hold the actual satellite components, doodads, and what sits in whatever you want to call it. Although, maybe maybe he has some kind of plan where they're, like, relatively small. Maybe it's actually the size of a Coke can, and if that's the case, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just, I'm just listening to the sound of my own voice. But, uh... Overall, I would not use it. I like I like a good upload and download speed, so I wouldn't want to have to worry about you know my satellite internet's not giving me that edge in an online competitive environment of video games. Hooey! I think I think I'm nearing the end. I'm about I'm about done, but uh, let me let me check the docket real quick. I gotta, I gotta check one thing real quick. Apart, apart from space internets, I think I'm about done. Oh wait, now, uh, per the request of uh, some other fellow, I did say I would talk about Mario, so I'm gonna go ahead and talk. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about Mario because. Uh, it, it is a request, and I, I do take a few requests. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have too much news about Mario, the uh, mustached Italiano plumber fellow. But uh, uh, from what I watched of the E3 stream, one of the one of the biggest bits of news that I have is the uh, 
what is it called? I ha I posted it earlier someplace. I think a gander. It's uh, some kind of the Super Mario stage creator. What, what did I what did I say? It's down here someplace. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Where is it? Uh, oh yeah, the Mario Maker. That's what it's called. So, what what is the Mario Maker? The Mario Maker is a uh, it is a level design, a level level crafting component used uh, to uh, to create these Mario stages. It was showcased at E3 in the 2015 Nintendo World Championships. Uh, Uh, what was it? And it it looked wild. Is it the best way I could describe it? I'm trying to think of all there was to see. And like I said, it uh, you could you could you could merge enemies together. So you could have like a a turtle on top of a Goomba that had a let a plant on top of the turtle shooting fireballs. You could jump in Bowser's little whirling little helicopter thing and navigate a stage. You could make Mario jump in a Goomba boot, and then make that Goomba boot jump into another boot, and then make that boot jump into a helicopter thing and fly through an obstacle course of bullet bills that, you know, bounce off turtle shell. It looked ridiculous. It looked like the craziest thing I've ever seen, and it also looked like a hell of a lot of fun, which makes me lament the fact that I do not have a Wii U. But at the same time, <laughs> I'm not going to buy the Wii U for just one game. And I've I've not seen particularly that many Wii U games that want to make me go out and buy a Wii U. That and the Wii U's multiplayer is it's still it's still baby's first online multiplayer. But then again, if you if you're if you're buying a Wii U, you're probably not the kind of guy who's really hard up to get you know uh, headshots in Call of Duty or be top of the leaderboards on some. Uh, FPS Fandango kind of deal. I don't know. But, eh, like I said, it, it looked real cool. It looked like a lot of fun. But it, it was not it was not able to make me rationalize a Wii U purchase. Let's see. And, uh, oh yeah, Yoshi the Dinosaur and uh, Mario's Son Luigi. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, but uh, I think I think that about wraps up wraps up my show. I'm in at 52 minutes, and I am I am fresh out of fresh out of stuff to talk about. Uh, I'm I'm just happy I'm happy I have work again. I recently got a job, and I, I am I am tired. I'm bushed, and we've not even started real work yet. I've just I've just kind of started the training of my job, and uh, I, I, I don't have a lot of confidence in my skills with the job right now, but um, I'm cautiously optimistic that it'll it'll be a good job once I actually figure out what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> but uh, I think that I think that about covers everything. Uh, bu -bu -bu, yeah, we're we we're at 52 minutes, so that that'll that'll do, pig. Although I won't be able to use the actual stream copy that I that, that I'm sending to YouTube right now due to the numerous 13,000 frames I've dropped at some point throughout this uh, presentation, and can as they continue to drop, I will upload the locally recorded version. So if if you missed it, or like I said, if you're watching live and everything went goofy, then you can watch the the local recording, which I hope will be of a somewhat higher quality than the than the live stream that I'm doing because lordy um, to remedy this problem I will be upgrading my internet soon because be a uh, I said my, my one megabyte up is not cutting it. it it barely cut it before it's hardly cutting it now so that's that's one thing I gotta I gotta deal with I gotta I gotta get that fixed pronto so go ahead, uh, press all the buttons, press press the likes, press the subscribes, 
whether you're watching it live or uh, a week from now, uh, I like I like all the all the all the publicity I can get. Uh, thanks again, and have a nice night, folks.